The Maritime Museum thing is still muted, but okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm I'm very happy to be here. I'm Vicki and I am the Marine Mammal Stranding Coordinator for North Carolina. And I'm happy to be here today at the Maritime Museum whose staff and volunteers contribute to excellent ongoing research and education and work in marine mammal science. I like questions, so anytime you have a question, this is a small group, so you can just blurt them out. I do wanna tell you that I'm hearing impaired. And so if I don't hear your question, I may approach you to try to, and ask you to repeat it. So I like to start out with this slide. This is a slide of um, Cape Lookout, as you can see the lighthouse in the background. And the, luckily I'm directing the very nice uh, heavy equipment operator to help transport this young baleen whale, it's a minke whale, out of the water onto the beach so we can examine it. So I will talk today about um, st strandings. I'll start with a stranding definition. I'll mention um, who are the responders in North Carolina. I'll talk about where marine mammals strand, when they occur, what we learn from them, and why any of this matters. So a strand, as you know, is a beach or land bordering a body of water. And stranded is defined as having run aground or being left in a helpless position as this definition above says. Today, I'll be talking about many species of marine mammals that strand on North Carolina beaches, riverbanks, and estuarine shores. <laughs> and the diversity of marine mammal species that occur in North Carolina. But for now, I want to clarify that I'll be referring to cetaceans, a term that includes whales, dolphins, and porpoises. And if you've attended Keith Rittmaster's presentations, you've likely learned about cetaceans and the differences between baleen whales and tooth whales and the differences between dolphins and porpoises. So ask any questions anytime during this talk. Yeah. Most marine mammal strandings are single animals and they're usually dead, almost always dead. About 90% of them um, show up on the beach as dead. However, sometimes mass strandings occur and are defined as a group of two or more cetaceans of the same species other than a female and her calf. When the numbers of stranded marine mammals occur on a larger scale, this may be classified as an unusual mortality event. We'll talk more about these later. North Carolina doesn't get as many mass strandings as some places in the United States, such as Cape Cod, but we have had a couple in the last 15 years. We had a group of 31 short fin pilot whales that stranded up at Cape Hatteras in January of 2005. And we had a mass stranding of Atlantic spotted dolphins that stranded following Hurricane Sandy inside Hatteras Inlet. Unusual mortality events that when the numbers of strandings peak, um, these can be caused by human interactions, ecological factors, um, infectious diseases, biotoxins. These photos are from the 2013-2014 morbillivirus UME. Morbillivirus is a virus that's similar to distemper in dogs, and it killed 
a lot of bottlenose dolphins along the North Carolina coast and all along the Atlantic coast. Currently, there is a humpback whale unusual mortality event that's occurring from Maine to Florida on the east coast of the US. Um, about 194 humpback whales have stranded, and you may have read about these in the newspapers. Almost half of them have been examined, and about 40% of the examined ones showed signs of human interaction, either ship strike or entanglement. A species we're very concerned about on the Atlantic coast is the North Atlantic right whale. Um, there is an unusual mortality event going on of these, and this chart is from NOAA and just shows the causes of the mortalities. Um, this year, there were three known entangled right whales that have serious injuries and one sublethal entanglement. A team consisting of Duke Marine Lab and Georgia researchers successfully removed some gear from a live North Atlantic right whale off the coast of North Carolina in January of this year. So that was hopefully a good sign. I'm really interested as I get older in history more and more. And um, the human response to marine mammal strandings over time has evolved. Um, humans have responded to strandings for as long as we can remember. And the Outer Banks of North Carolina has a long history of hurricanes, as we know, and shipwrecks, and likely have the longest record of marine mammal strandings in the world, dating back to 1884. The idea of regulating human and animal activities came into our thinking back in ancient times. And in the 19th century, the idea that maybe animals require protection, that led to a growth of interest in animal law. In the 20th century, in the 1970s, there was a, a spike in environmental concern and activism that led to some of the laws that we operate under today. The focus on commercial whaling sparked the public's fascination with whales and dolphins. In North Carolina, we have a rich history of hunting marine mammals. We hunted sperm whales dating back to the mid 1600s um, offshore. We hunted North Atlantic right whales, the middle whale here, um, from the shore from the 1750s to the early 1900s from Shackleford Bank, um, for instance. And there was a porpoise fishery. These are neither porpoises and nor fish. They're dolphins and they're mammals, but it was called a porpoise fishery in the literature. And this lasted from the late 1700s to the early 1900s. And these were some of the primary targets of North Carolina, hunting marine mammals, but lots of species were taken. Whoops, sorry. Um, you may have seen this drawing of a North Atlantic right whale on the beach at Beaufort. This is probably from um, Shackleford, and there's an inset of the open boats used to chase after whales. And the Maritime Museum has some good um, depictions and descriptions of, of some of these activities. The man standing at the bow in that boat has a harpoon that was attached to a canvas drogue, like a sort of a bag to slow the whale down after the whale was harpooned. And crews lived on Shackleford, and some of the crew would be on a sand dune and keep a lookout for whales passing by. These whales were called right whales because they were the right whales to kill. They moved slowly and migrated close to the coast, often with their calves. And so next March, when it's cold and windy, imagine living on Shackleford for months at a time and looking for whales all winter. It sounds romantic, but I think the conditions were probably really harsh. 
They would drag the whales back to the beach and then peel off the blubber and boil down the blubber. The whales would be passing by on their migration um, to the northern waters in the summer months to feed on the rich invertebrate um, schools that were up there. Whaling and whale oil was really important to Carteret County and the rest of North Carolina. Records show that many parcels of land were purchased by sales of whale oil. <clears throat> so important was this whale oil that there are two North Atlantic right whales on the Carteret County seal based on the Carteret County coat of arms. And you can see the county seal on trucks and buildings. The right whale is easily identified by the lack of a dorsal fin. North Carolina is a fascinating place to study bottlenose dolphins, partly due to the history. Although the literature calls this a porpoise fishery, the animals killed, as I mentioned, were dolphins and they weren't fish, but mammals. A bottlenose dolphin harvest operation was active at Fort Macon, Shackelford, and Cape Hatteras from the late 1700s to 1860. It stopped briefly for the Civil War and then resumed again and lasted until 1929. The main product was a high quality oil from the lower jaw of the dolphin that was used for lubrication of machinery, um, clocks and watches. During a single season, which lasted from November to May, you can see that approximately 1200 dolphins were killed. Commercial whaling or killing marine mammals is not legal in this country now, but a few whales are allowed to be killed by indigenous people in Alaska each year. The two primary laws that affect marine mammals are the Marine Mammal Protection Act that was passed in 1972 and the Endangered Species Act in 1973. And there are celebrations planned for the 50 year anniversary of the ESA this year. The jurisdiction over marine mammals within branches of the US government is not that simple. NOAA Fisheries under the Department of Commerce has jurisdiction over whales, dolphins, porpoises, and seals and sea lions, while the Fish and Wildlife Service under the Department of the Interior has jurisdiction over walrus, manatees, sea otters, and polar bears. We don't have sea otters on this coast. What we have are river otters, um, but there's no biological basis for this split but it can make things complicated for stranding responders. So this is a timeline of legal events. The Marine Mammal Protection Act 72 and the Endangered Species Act in 73. And then in 1977, there was a mass stranding of pilot whales near Mayport, Florida. And authorities in Washington started getting calls and letters expressing concern that qualified scientists had been denied access to these pilot whales and to these carcasses to collect useful data. And so a lot of information was consequently lost. Individuals recommended that a workshop should be held. And so a workshop was held. And finally, um, in 1992, the National Marine Mammal Stranding Network was established. So the goals of the Marine Mammal Stranding Network in this country are to minimize the threats of stranded animals to human health, to minimize the suffering of live stranded marine mammals, to get as much benefit, to learn as much as we can from these animals, and to establish long-term data series so we can look for variations in peaks and strandings and try to learn from that. So who are the responders in North Carolina? Well, here are some of them. North Carolina has a collaborative, cordial, supportive group of stranding network volunteers um, and staff that I'm privileged to work with. I've heard that not every state in the country 
gets along so well. The stranding responders don't get along as well as we do, but we're really, really lucky. We learn from each other, we support each other, we help each other. And people in this room, Carrie, Sue, Keith, at least, um, have helped respond to stranding. So thank you so much. And these people represent a lot of different organizations that support and collaborate With stranding response, a lot of times it can be me and me explaining things to the public, but I often have really good volunteers and sometimes I have an assistant. So where do these green mammal strandings occur in North Carolina? Well, you may have seen this map showing the outer continental shelf and the inner continental shelf, and there's an arrow pointing to Beaufort there. Um, this geographic feature really makes a difference in the diversity of strandings that we have here. And the flora and fauna diversity off the coast of our state has been well documented. And another reason for this diversity are the oceanographic currents. The warm Gulf Stream waters depicted in red flowing up along the coast, meeting off Cape Hatteras, the cool Virginia current, Western boundary currents. And part of the reason we see so much diversity in flora and fauna is due to this thermal gradient and the shelves being so close to the North Carolina coast. So here's where some strandings have occurred that I've responded to from, 2020, from 2009 to 2023, all these dots. And I know you can't read the names on the right, those just represent the species, but I wanna point out that there are strandings in the Albemarle Sound, up above, there are strandings all along the coastline, of course, there are strandings in the Pamlico Sound, um, there are strandings way up the Tar River, west of Greenville. There are strandings in the Noose River, up to New Bern. So strandings occur in all kinds of estuaries and ocean beaches and riverbanks. So in our state, we divide up response into three different areas. In the northern part, depicted in green, it's the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, Jeanette's Pier, and Cape Hatteras National Seashore. The red part is my responsibility. And so I'm responsible for Albemarle, Pamlico Sound, and the rivers, and then down as far as Camp Lejeune. And I share Ocracoke with the Northern responders. The purple part is the responsibility of UNCW. But when something unusual or large or multiple numbers of animals strand, then often the partners from the entire state respond and a lot of you as well. So when do these strandings happen? They happen year round. The average from 2009 to 2022 is the blue line. So you can see April is the peak month um, right now, it's starting to taper off a little bit. The red bars are the past year. So you can see how the past year coincides or differs from the average over the last 15 years. And um, we have a little lull in September, and then it picks up again in December and is pretty busy in the winter and spring. So what species of marine mammals strand in North Carolina? We never know. When I get a call, people are wonderful about describing animals and taking pictures, and often they estimate length, which is usually off by several feet, but that's okay. Um, but we do get a lot of different species that strand here. 66% of the marine mammals that strand are bottlenose dolphins. Um, we get about 125 strandings reported every year. Um, and this graph 
This pie chart shows the other species other than bottlenose dolphins. So we have um, humpback, a lot of humpback whales, a lot of harbor porpoises, the only species of porpoise that we get, um, short beak common dolphins, Atlantic spotted dolphins, uh, pygmy and dwarf sperm whales, harbor seals, Gervais peaked whales, and short fin pilot whales. Those are the major ones. And then we have some really unusual species too that occasionally strand here. So we have more diversity than any state on the East Coast, at least, and one of the highest areas of diversity in the world. This is um, a graphic that Keith made and just showing you pictures of some of the whales, dolphins, and porpoises that North Carolina has recorded in the last 35 years, so 34 species. The baleen whales are swimming to your right, and the tooth whales are swimming to your left. And the gray whale we used to have here, but it's extinct. Um, but all the other animals circled, including killer whales, blue whales, sperm whales. Um, so we get a ton of diversity. So it's really an exciting place to study marine mammals. We get seals. Um, four species of seals. And these animals usually are juveniles and they just haul out on the beaches to rest. Um, they need to be left alone, but people get really worried. Sometimes they take them plates of hush puppies, which is not a good idea. It's not legal to feed marine mammals just because we don't want them to get dependent and people really don't know what they typically eat. It's not hush puppies. Um, We also get manatees and people report them and give me testimonials about how long they've lived there and there's never been a manatee in their area, but we do get them. Um, and their sightings are pretty common through the summer and into the fall. So what happens when a marine mammal washes up on the beach? This is what the public thinks when a marine mammal strands alive. The caption says, it was just a hypoglycemic episode. Could you get me some candy and push me back in? The public suggests that we should push or pull or tow the animal back into the water and they think that that will solve it. And I understand they wanna help. Um, I feel that way too. You know, we wanna help wildlife and that's a complicated emotion, but it's true, we do want to. They often attempt trying to put animals back into the water before contacting the stranding network. And this can be really dangerous for the animal and for the people. The reality of what's going on with a stranded animal is almost always very different. When single marine mammals wash ashore, there's almost always a serious health issue that has debilitated the whale, dolphin, or porpoise. Seals come ashore to rest, that's fine. Um, but other animals don't. I tell my students, if you were to go out and lie down in the middle of I-40, there would be a problem. And it's the same with these marine mammals. If they felt good, they would be swimming, not lying on the beach. So what's a, a typical day? My office at the NC State Lab at CMAST, um, which is on the western side of the community college campus in Moorhead. I answer calls, I try to get transport to go to strandings, I contact volunteers, I work with a lot of veterinarians at NC State, which is wonderful. Um, often the transportation involves a lot of logistics, um, driving a truck to get on a boat, to get on an ATV. Um, we collect a lot of samples, we write reports, we send data off and we apply for grants. When we first get a stranding call, I ask how many animals? Um, is the animal alive or dead? Where is it? Um, and I ask them to send me a picture. Before we had cell phones, it was much more difficult because the descriptions were 
wildly interesting. Um, if the animal's live, we work with veterinarians and veterinary residents at NC State, and they come with us. And that's really, really lucky. Um, it's great experience for them, and it really helps us, and we learn from each other. I contact the regional stranding coordinator. Um, we evaluate the animal. We decide what's going on with it. Um, we usually euthanize single live stranded animals. Um, there's a very low rehabilitation success with them, and, and it's very expensive, and there's no rehab facility nearby. Um, then we submit samples and write reports and dispose of the remains. For dead animals, again, we identify the species. We take dorsal fin photos to see if we know the individual. Keith Rittmaster and Duke Marine Lab and a lot of people track dorsal fin photos of bottlenose dolphins up and down the coast so we know a lot about their movements and their life histories. We transport animals to the lab if we can because we have much better facilities. It's a little easier than necropsying on the beach. We try to find the cause of death, but a lot of times we don't know. Um, we measure them and sample them and then send samples off for analysis. Um, we, we look externally at the carcass so we can tell toothed whales from baleen whales, the odontocetes versus mysticetes. We can tell the sex by looking at the genital slit. And we collect a lot of data. Most of what we know about some species is from stranded animals because some marine mammals are really cryptic and they live way offshore and they're deep diving and they're rarely at the surface. Um, we submit data about each stranding within 24 hours of the event. And these data are tracked by NOAA fisheries so they can look for spikes in stranding numbers regionally or nationally. So we collect all these tissue samples and these are some of the uses. For instance, photographs, as I said, we can identify the individual sometimes. Skin can tell us about genetics, so what stock it's from. Um, teeth to slice them and, and determine age. Tissue samples for a lot of different histo and virology, toxicology. Um, the reproductive tissues can tell us about the life history of the animal. Um, the stomach contents can tell us about the food habits, so what species of fish it was eating or, or squid. And parasites can tell us a lot about its habitat or pathology. We collect a lot of samples from very fresh animals and fewer from more decomposed animals. So what do we learn from stranded marine mammals? We learn about the possible causes of death, although often we can't determine the cause of death because it may be cumulative. The causes we can determine include natural causes such as disease, bacterial and viral, infanticide, um, predation by other species, maternal abandonment, or cumulative impacts. Anthropogenic causes may include entanglement in fishing gear, either active or passive, ship strikes, um, ingestion of plastics, um, acoustic trauma, sometimes accumulations of all these, and stress. So what would you say this is? Yes. Very good. Oops. What about this one? A couple things going on here. Sorry. Predation. Yeah, predation. So a shark bite there. A shark bite there. And what about the tail? Cut off probably from being caught in a net. So um, this animal was entangled 
in in monofilament and we tried to rescue it but um were not successful because the monofilament had cut too deeply into the mandible and into the spinal column back near the tail um what about this one what's going on here So what's the upper animal? Can anybody tell? It's a it's a whale, a minke whale that's about 14 feet long, probably. So what's that other animal? Sure. Shark. It's a great white. Yeah. So this picture was taken off Beaufort Inlet by um Coast Guard um personnel. And yeah, so. If that whale is 14 feet, the shark is bigger. So don't swim seven is kilometers it, off Beaufort Inlet. Does it end up eating? I mean, yes, a, and it so did. They call it in the process, that picture. Yes, yeah, yeah. This is early, yeah, yeah. Natural predation. Um, these were stomach contents. Everything on the tarp is from a sperm whale stomach. So ingestion and plastic. I know most of us are careful about our trash, but it's really important to remember not to just cut your fishing line and dispose of it. Try not to let things blow away. I know it's really difficult, um, but whales and other species of marine life ingest it and are harmed by it. Um, so this is a happy live dolphin photo break zen moment by Keith Ripmaster, just to give you a break from some of the stranding information. Um, so these are some more of the things we learned. We track individuals, as I said. So this was one of the female dolphins that stranded in 2016. Um, and we had seen her and photographed her from 1989 through 2015. And she was a mom and she had calves. Yoy stand for young of the year um, in that middle chart. So she had calves in 93, 96, 98, 2002, and 2004. And those dots on the map are sightings of where she was seen up in the Noose River around Beaufort over the years. So it's great that we have an endpoint. We're sorry that she died, but it's valuable to have this information about her life. This is another stranding that just occurred um, in April, actually. And this, this stranding occurred in Swansboro near Hammocks Beach State Park. And this animal has a sighting history from 1987 to 2022. And she had given birth to at least six calves over the years. And she was seen as far as um, up in Pamlico Sound and as far south as Wilmington. So putting all this information together really tells us about the movements of these animals. This is a case of a humpback whale that we saw in Core Sound. And if you know Core Sound, it's really long, narrow, and shallow. And it's not a place for whales, typically. It's not good habitat, it's not deep enough, and it doesn't usually have the kind of food thereafter. Um, so this is a live eight meter humpback whale that was sighted there. We went out and photographed it. And then we were able to fly with a Marine patrol and saw it on a shoal and it appeared to be scratching its back. And then it stranded um, and I think this is in the wrong place. One second, sorry. Um, it's stranded, and this is Bill McClellan, one of the great stranding responders who was examining the, the whale in that bottom photo and had deep propeller cuts in it. And this photo of the underside of the tail is how we identify individuals. So it was still alive and because it was being scavenged, we did have to euthanize it with the help of, of several veterinarians and then we necropsied it. 
This minky whale stranded with gear attached to the lower jaw at the end of it. Um, the gear was attached, was identified as a piece of scallop trawl. The gear was removed and the animal was pushed back out and it swam along the shore for a little bit and came right back in alive. And then it was pushed back out again and it swam for a little while and it came back ashore. And so the decision was made to euthanize it. And after the necropsy, we determined that the animal was likely unable to feed correctly due to the entanglement of this gear on the lower jaw. Um, this question. Question. In other words, a whale that's entangled and dies can make or should try to give it a good result. However, they could have been sick first. You know what I'm asking? Yeah. In other words, the entanglement was the result maybe of the condition of the whale ship, right? The yeah. Um, so the question was, if we can tell whether animals that are entangled or ship struck, if they were sick first. And that's a great question, Carrie. And we do look for that and try to determine if that may have affected its behavior. Um, and sometimes the, uh, the effects are cumulative. Yes, maybe it was entangled and couldn't move out of the way of the ship. Um, and maybe it affected um, different things. So yes, that's a Good question, and we do look for that. And we, when we write up our reports, we list all the symptoms and the findings of the testing that we do on the tissues and everything. Um, but yeah, that can be the case sometimes. Um, this was a beaked whale, and beaked whales are very deep, deep diving animals. And this animal stranded in Corolla, North Carolina, way up near the Virginia border. And it was transported to the vet school where we did a CT scan to see if it had acoustic trauma. We did a CT scan on the brain. Um, and we didn't find any acoustic trauma, but we did find a lot of parasites in the brain. And we also found plastic in the stomach. So in that picture over on your left, um, there's a, a cap in a, part of a men's Chanel lotion container that we could actually read the label and then a packing strap that was all in the stomach. So all these things cumulatively, cumulatively may have contributed to the whale's death. Um, more recently, we have this goose-beaked whale strand, um, the Xiphius cavarostris. And Keith and Carrie and a lot of others have helped prepare the skeleton. It's now hanging at Duke Marine Lab. And there was a heavy load of parasites called crassicata in the left and right kidneys. And then there was corresponding mineralization or hardening in the surrounding vessels and the dorsal aorta. So parasites are normal in a lot of these animals, but when the load is extremely heavy, they can cause a lot of anatomical and medical complications. Um, this was a North Atlantic right whale that stranded on Shark Island. Um, and it had been entangled at a young age and so it had resulting scoliosis. Um, scoliosis is abnormal curvature of the spine. And we were frankly surprised that the animal could survive as long as it did because it must've been really painful to swim. In this year of January, some of you may have heard about the North Atlantic right whale calf that was sighted. Um, and that map you can see was first sighted of Radio Island. To the right is Shackleford and to the left of Radio Island is the port. So the first sighting was at that yellow pin and then it was last seen at the Moorhead City port. The calf's mom was nowhere to be seen, despite searching by kayak, motorboat, and plane. 
the search crew included a lot of really experienced people. The North Carolina Maritime Museum, um, Clearwater Marine Aquarium Research Institute, North Atlantic Right Whale Flight Crew, who were here in this area for six months just looking for whales, for right whales in this area. The North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries Marine Patrol, Duke Marine Lab, North Carolina State University, CMAST. Um, so we searched on January 4th and January 5th. We were told to stand down on the 6th, and then the whale was found dead on the 7th. Um, the animal was extracted from under the pier by North Carolina State CMAS, DMF, the North Carolina Maritime Museum, and Division of Marine Fisheries, and it was towed to Fort Macon State Park for necropsy on the 8th. Um, the calf was found to be only a couple days old, um, and it had an open umbilicus and neonatal cardiac features, and it would not have survived without its mom. We still don't know where the mom is or who the mom is. So genetic samples have been sent to try to match, and people are working on this all the time. We've had many, many calls, and so we're trying to figure out what happened. Yes. I read that it was three weeks old. You say several days. Days. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Days. So and we just don't know where the mom is. Um, there wasn't milk in the stomach. We don't know if it had nursed or not, but there was no milk in the stomach. Yeah. So very sad. Um, so here's some of our research results. Um, wrapping up quickly, um, the from stranding work, we found that bottlenose dolphins have seasonal reproduction um, in the spring and a smaller peak in the fall. Um, I mentioned that we have some really unusual species. This was a white-beaked dolphin that had adrenal tumors. And so the normal range you can see in that map up there is north of the United States. So this was the first record, the most southerly record ever of this species. And it came inshore alive and stranded in near Rachel Carson Estrin Reserve. Um, and so these adrenal tumors in cats and dogs cause pacing and anxiety and um, a lot of agitation. And so our hypothesis is that maybe in this whale, it caused it to just keep swimming and it just kept swimming south because it was anxious. And so it was the adrenal tumor was causing this. Um, we've, we've tried to reduce secondary toxicity. When we euthanize large whales, we don't want other scavengers to eat that flesh, the remains, and then die. And this has happened a lot with vultures and cattle, you know, all around the world. And so what Dr. Harms and we discovered was to use potassium chloride instead of these heavy, heavy drugs. So we sedate the animals so they don't feel anything and they're pain-free. Um, and then we can use potassium chloride and that is a humane and better environmentally and ecologically um, sound drug to use on youth, for euthanasia. Um, we found manatees are in mid-Atlantic estuaries from June to October in North Carolina and Virginia. And when water temperatures start going lower, they hopefully head south. Um, we found from submitting samples that bottlenose dolphins have significantly higher levels of lead and all these manganese, mercury, zinc um, in them. Adult male bottlenose dolphins had higher iron levels than females, probably because females nurse and give birth. So they can get rid of some of their contaminant loads by having calves. Um, 
One happy, yes. Okay, um, Sue asked me to mention that um, when newborn bottlenose dolphins nurse, depending on where they're born in the birth order, sometimes they get a heavy load of contaminants from the mom. And so they're more prone to death, especially the firstborn. After that, the subsequent calves often can survive. Um, so this inflatable whale is something that we borrowed and we are practicing with Tobo US, who is very generous with their time and equipment to try to help us figure out how we can refloat live stranded whales if they seem okay and they're just on a shoal and they can be rescued. We can't do it with normal equipment. We can't tow it out by the tail because that can separate the vertebra and that would cause paralysis. And we certainly don't want to do more harm than good when responding to these strandings. So Tobo US has these inflatable tubes that we could put underneath the animal. We practice with this and then making harnesses and trying to pull them, pull the whales off. Um, they're very helpful. We need to do more practice practice sessions, but I'm just letting you know that we are trying to think of new ways um, to try to help these animals when possible. So why is this important? And I was thinking about Tina Turner yesterday and today and what what's love got to do with it. And um, we do a lot of this work because we care so deeply about the animals and we hope that what we do makes a positive difference and contributes to the science and what is known for future animals. These animals are long lived top predators and eat a lot of the same fish we eat. So they really are ecosystem sentinels or canaries in the coal mine and collecting as much scientific information as we can from these stranded animals that I think our gifts from the ocean um, can hopefully help animals in the future. So this is the number to call if you find a stranded marine mammal, day or night, 24 seven, birthdays, holidays, weekends, always. Um, and um, thank you to everyone in this room and um, everyone who has helped over the years um, and people on Zoom. And I do have a three minute video, if anybody wants to watch it, of um, a necropsy that we did. Um, and it just shows how we systematically peel back. It's, it's sped up. did work. So this with a bunch of NC State students and just shows the measuring and, and everything and then feeling back. But if you have any questions, I'm Happy to answer them. The mandibles from that minke whale that was pushed off and swam are, are here and they show the marks in the bone from the line. And I brought in some baleen, if you haven't seen that, and some barnacles from a humpback whale and some free books to give away about Inky the whale, about a stranding. Yes. How much plastic are you seeing these days? I mean, that's one of my main things. I yes. Um, so the question was how much plastic um, I'm seeing. Interestingly enough, Harriet, we find plastic in the deeper offshore divers. We find much less in the inshore 
which is the opposite of what I would think, because the closer animals like bottlenose dolphins are close to us right. who are disposing of the plastic inappropriately uh, constantly. Um, but I do have a student this summer who's going to look at microplastics mm -hmm. in the stomachs. And, um, and so she has a little bit of funding. And so we're going to see if we find microplastics, because I think often the plastic breaks down and we can't see it visually. We do examine stomach contents. We find very little. I can count on one hand the debris I've found in bottlenose dolphin stomachs. One was staple, one was part of a lure that was plastic, um, but a hook, you know, so, so not much plastic, but that's a great question. But in the offshore divers, we do see more plastic like that beaked whale and plastic bags um, and other things, yeah. So. A year do you have, you know, generally speaking? Um, about 125, yeah, in North Carolina, a year. Okay, of those families, do you kind of have an idea, like, how many show boat strikes, how many show entanglement, uh, what percentage would show natural causes? Yes, um, so it's it's a little complicated because a lot of animals aren't in good enough shape to evaluate for entanglement, but of the animals um, that we can tell, I would say um, like 25% entanglement maybe, I'm guessing. I have to go back and, and look at that. We can do it for specific periods of time, but we have to look at fresher animals versus very decomposed animals. So um, that's that's a a great question. Um, but it's important to know there these animals do die of natural causes too. Old age sometimes the teeth get so worn that I think they're unable to grasp fish and feed on them. Um, so. Yes. What percent of deaths simply sink when you don't see them stranded? It's been estimated know. that at least 50% of the animals that died never make it yeah. to the beach yeah. for whatever reason. They may not sink, but they may be consumed by great whites like that minke whale. They may um, just wash up on a remote beach mm -hmm. where they're never reported. We get many more reports of animals along ocean beaches because people walk on ocean beaches. But if you've been around the estuaries, and I know you have, um, there's Spartina, there's Junkus, there's spike, you know, very spiky grass, oysters. So a lot of the shorelines are not conducive to walking or finding stranded marine mammals. So I think less than half of what are reported um, is you know, what, what less than half of what strands are reported, I'm guessing. And that's just ballpark because we really don't know. Yes. So you keep mentioning the uh, North Carolina uh, state veterinarians. Is there a team of them that are here? Yes. Okay. Yes. I so about their functions here, but I didn't know that there was. Yes. Some... So it's, it's great. Um, so Dr. Harms, is here and his position is at um, CMAST, but at CMAST, the NC State Lab in Moorhead, we also have a veterinary residency program. Mm -hmm. So it's an aquatic program, one of very few in the country, like five maybe, where veterinarians who have already graduated from vet school come here and get experience just like a medical human doctor gets, mm -hmm. does a residency program to get experience. So they come here and they're here for several years. They spend time with me doing strandings. They work at the Sea Turtle Hospital. They spend some time at the zoo. Sometimes they go to the Pinniped Center on the West Coast to work with sea lions and seals. Um, but it's wonderful to have them um, because of their experience and, and our experience. You know, We share a lot of information. So we're really lucky. In other parts of the state, 
there are veterinarians who volunteer, um, but it's difficult. I mean, as you probably know, being a veterinarian is a really high stress job. It's not the animals, often it's the owners um, that can be stressful. And so it's, it's really difficult. So for veterinarians to volunteer their time is amazing to help with these. But and it's great to have experienced vets like Craig and Dr. Christensen and Dr. Westmoreland are two veterinarians for the North Carolina Aquariums. So they are also here and they are great. And they are often the backup for Dr. Harms when he goes on research projects like next month he's going to Norway to test baleen whale hearing and minke whales. Um, so he'll be gone for the whole month. So other veterinarians can help. Great if we need them, yeah. Um, but come up and take a book and look at these things. This is a model that I got that shows the organs um, through 